Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. Welcome to this webinar titled Textiles in Circular Economy, brought to you by Chamber Low Carbon, the Circular Economy Club of the Liverpool City Region and the Liverpool Fashion Summit. My name is Ollie, Ollie Kennedy. I'm a co-founder of the Liverpool Fashion Summit. And I'll be chairing today's event and hoping to do my bit to make this a wonderfully valuable time for you all. I must apologize for the lighting in here. I had some technical internet issues recently and I'm now in a cafe, but hopefully um, that was the last technical issue that we'll have today. Um, and when I say welcome to you all, uh, I am filled with excitement really, knowing who all of you are um, which I'll come on to in a minute. Um, so for those of you who haven't already, please do introduce yourself in the chat over the next couple of minutes. Let us know who you are, where you come from, and, and why you're here um, as well. Um, just a bit of housekeeping to start with. Um, all the participants are on mute and off camera. Um, please do ask any questions that you wish during the webinar, and we can hope to answer them at the end. Um, and please do so using the, the Q&A function, um, which should be at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you can, please avoid using the chat function when the panelists are speaking, just so we can give them uh, our full attention. Um, and there will be ample time for networking and discussions at the end. Just so you all know, this session is being recorded so we can share the conversations and the debate far and wide afterwards. Now. The circular economy is increasingly being discussed as an answer to some of the most wicked problems that are currently so pervasive in the world. And I think the sheer number of people on this webinar from across the world is absolutely testament to this. Um, so I personally wanna say hello to our participants and attendees in England, France, Germany, the Netherlands. Uh, we have a couple from New York, Brazil, India, Canada, so many, many different time zones. I'm technically in Bahrain, so um, it's now five o'clock here, and I'm sure some of you it's very early, and I'm so sure for others, others of you it's very late as well. But it is wonderful to have you all here, and um, it does show that it's a, a global issue with global interest. Um, so please do bring your insights um, and your challenges for the Q&A a little bit later on. Um, I think at this early time, we'd like to run a short poll, uh, just to two questions to gauge exactly who is on the webinar and who we're speaking to. So I think uh, Stephen uh, is going to help us run that now. And please do complete this um, just whilst I finish my, uh, my opening gambit. Um, we have an all-star lineup for you today. And, and ultimately, our aim really is to raise awareness of the principles of the circular economy by taking an in-depth look at the textiles and fashion industries. And we want to highlight the practical action we can all take. Now our panel is from academia, textiles and the fashion sectors. And they'll all share their experiences of the challenges, the opportunities and collaborations that can be gained from moving to this linear um, extraction sort of approach or model to a more circular model. How are we doing on the on the poll, Stephen? Is everyone uh, reactive and behaving? Uh, Seventy three percent have voted up to now. Seventy three, right? Well, when we left the last twenty seven, um, I will introduce our first speaker just before we look at the polls. Um, so our first speaker, who will set the scene for us, bring us into this circular economy universe, um, is Dr. Helen Gavorik, um, an author and lecturer at the University of Durham. Um, in the UK, I should add to our global audience, her research within the textile industry explores buying behavior and the relationships between product development and sustainability. Helen also has several years experience in buying and design management for retailers and manufacturers in the, in the UK um, and is a, uh, a professional liaison with overseas suppliers. Um, so in a moment, we will welcome with open arms Helen to uh, to take us through a short presentation of around 10 minutes. Um, and as I say, any questions that do come up, please do put them uh, in the Q&A. So having a look at the poll results, uh, the majority are students. So welcome, old students. Fantastic that, that Helen's first up. 
um, we have some academics, some designers, wonderful, um, no manufacturers, um, a small number of retailers, um, waste management, a good few, consultants and advisors, a good few, and interested others. Um, those interested others, please do tell us um, at the end what that interested other is. Um, I'm sure we'd be really excited to know. Okay, that's wonderful. So I think that's, that's enough from me for now. Without further ado, I will hand over to Dr. Helen Gavorik. Okay, so um, I'm going to run through some slides today, which will pick up on some of the key points. And I'm very conscious, especially from that poll that Stephen's just done, that we've got some people here who haven't perhaps been um, involved in this and it might be new to them. And then we've also got very experienced people. So I'm going to try and run across all those um, different areas and perhaps um, uh, appeal to some by offering some further information if anyone wants to read further into that. So my research looks at sustainable fashion in particular, and through the contacts that I made when I worked in the fashion business, um, this was really helpful to me to have a, a clear understanding of how that operates in practice. And my interest in looking at sustainability um, came about around 14 years ago when I went to an industry conference um, and that really inspired me to have a look at those sustainability angles. So I feature that in most of my teaching, most of my writing, um, and obviously I appreciate the significance of the circular economy as part of that. So the slides that are here will be available um, to you afterwards. If you get in touch, then you can, uh, you can have access to them. So could I have the next slide, please, Joe? So the key question that we're posing is how can this very linear industry um, become more circular? And so we're trying to raise awareness of the principles of the circular economy. So I looked at this as my brief um, for the key points to bring up in this presentation. And I'm looking more broadly at textiles and fashion and the various speakers that we have will uh, take more of an in-depth look into this and offer a variety of, of insights so that we're not just talking about this but we're looking at what we can do in practice and I think that's that's the key outcome that we're hoping for from this session. So we've been asked to consider experiences of the challenges, opportunities and collaborations um, which could be gained from moving um, from a linear to a more circular model. So I'll give you an overview of, of how that might work in practice um, from my own perspective, but also drawing from literature and from industry experience. Next slide, please, Joe. So this is um, a model that I use in my teaching. I've used it in my book about the careers um, in fashion and textiles and how the industry operates. And it's generally seen that the supply chain is a very linear setup. So we clearly start from raw materials um, such as cotton plants and go right through to the products being sold by retailers. Now, this is a very simplistic model of it, of course. I appreciate that there are often lots of different stages in between, um, lots of intermediaries in the different stages, maybe multiple suppliers as well at the different levels. And despite that, you can also have sometimes companies that do com combine more than one of these, um, these stages. But roughly speaking, that's generally what happens in the fashion business and applies to textile products generally. So it's linear, it's what we might call cradle to grave. So the products are developed and then they're disposed of at the end. And that's the standard that we've been uh, become used to, especially in contemporary times and, and in the West. So I think there is a, a particularly Western emphasis on this, um, but it's also representative of, of how things operate throughout the world. Clearly within that model, you can also um, imagine that many different countries might be involved, different continents and so on. Um, so they might take place all in the same country, but typically um, they would be spread around the world and there are other sustainability impacts there where things are delivered from one country to the next. I think as consumers um, who see perhaps the, the shop window um, that I photographed at, at the bottom there, they don't really think in depth about what's happened, what the story is behind the clothing, but clearly the media are starting to expose that um, more nowadays. 
So next slide, please, Joe. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about some research that I've been involved in for DEFRA, um, which is what used to be the Department of the Environment um, for the government. So working with a team of colleagues, uh, particularly at Nottingham Trent University, um, where I used to work, we have been um, tasked with a, a couple of major projects um, which looked into firstly sustainable clothing back in 2008 um, and then also more recently a more specific project which was looking into how we could enhance the longevity of clothing and I thought this was a particularly apt um, topic to discuss here and one of the reasons why I've been asked um, today through being involved in that research. So the first project that we did, um, the team just wanted to know what did the public actually think sustainable clothing was? Um, how did they react to it? How did they interact? What might they learn in terms of their habits, etc.? So the research for that and then for the new project, um, with them being government funded, they are available on the government websites. All the detail is there. Some of you may find them useful either as an academic reference or perhaps something to inform your practice. Um, and the links are later on in the presentation because um, sadly the government website tends to hide things away a lot. Um, and you can only find them if you really know exactly what it is that you're looking for. Um, so feel free to download those if you find them useful. But I do also have some slides which summarise our more recent project about clothing longevity um, so that you can pick up the key points without having to trawl through the boring academic report side of it. Um, so the clothing longevity project was really to have a look at some of the obstacles in terms of both strategy and behaviour um, in terms of implementing innovative and sustainable product development processes that could enhance clothing longevity. So in essence, that was going out and talking to people um, in business, asking them how they developed products, trying to find good practice and to see how that could work, um, all with the aim of improving clothing longevity, which fits so neatly within the circular economy. Um, we wanted to look at the knowledge and the skills that would be required for that. Next slide, please. So um, in doing that research, we um, looked into a lot of the literature that was relevant to this, particularly in academic sources, but we never just work in isolation in the academic side. Um, the group all have experience in industry, this particular research group, and we know how important it is to look at current practice. Um, so some of the key issues which were involved in our project and also in uh, the circular economy generally are that there are um, environmental impacts in the production, distribution and disposal phase of the clothing life cycle. We investigated those in more depth and for our topic today, um, clearly the disposal phase is, is the key element, the one that we need to look at closely to close this loop and uh, to create that circle. So life cycle assessment is a tool that has been used um, that found that extending garments active life um, via a variety of different aspects um, was the most effective method that could be used to reduce the impact on the environment. Um, and one of the stats that we found was that if you extended the average life of clothes by three months, um, you would reduce various other impacts by five to 10 percent. So if we say extend the average life of clothes by a year, obviously we're multiplying that um, and we can make a big impact leading to um, lots of savings, which is what the companies will tend to be um, focusing on in many cases, um, but also reducing that environmental impact. Next slide, please, Joe. So if we can increase the usable life of clothing and replace it less frequently, this can obviously have a big impact. Um, and this is something that my research colleague, Tim Cooper, who looks at longevity of products, um, had found was one of the key areas that we could explore. Um, and when I talk about increasing the usable life of clothing, um, I'm not just thinking that we should retain clothes for longer, but that we can put them into the circular economy for others uh, to use as well. 
So there's a few different approaches that brands and retailers can take to enhance product longevity. Um, and that initial stage is particularly important because it has an effect on what happens throughout the lifetime of those products. So it's really important for designers to understand and be effectively trained um, in that respect. And um, a good example there is a range that was called Keep and Share, where the products were designed not to be fashionable, not to be unfashionable either, but to be classic and interesting designs and also to be available for hire. So using a, a different business model than uh, the standard. So Amy Twigger Holroyd, um, it was somebody who set that up uh, at quite an early stage. Um, next slide, please. So um, I'll just mention briefly the phases that are important here. So product development, production and purchase. Um, so looking through that linear model that ended with retailer, obviously um, these all fit into that retail aspect. So uh, retailers and brands, uh, if relevant, are involved in all of these aspects. And it, what tends to happen is that they consider the product up to that point and then it becomes um, in the ownership of consumers and I'm proposing that in order to engage in the circular economy it's important to change that mindset instead of thinking right well that's finished it's out of my door um, let's move on to the next product that we've already started on um, that we have to consider that consumers are a part of that that loop so building longevity into clothing um, is important um, and obviously there's been a lot written about fast fashion and in contrast to that some uh, such as Safia Mini have written about slow fashion to, to contrast with that. And um, there has been identified a, a level of demand for clothes that last longer which we're, we're aiming to encourage with our research. So something that retailers and brands can do is to choice edit. Um, in other words, they've already filtered through the products that are available and decided which ones are going to be um, accessible to their customers. So Sainsbury's, for example, did a range of T-shirts previously where they decided they would only offer sustainable options. I noticed they're not doing it anymore, but they, they did do it at the time, which meant that um, it made it easier for the consumer to, uh, to make a more sustainable choice. Next slide, please. So in terms of usage, this is a really important phase um, in terms of the circular economy um, and in terms of being more sustainable in general. So um, if consumers have a good understanding of how they actually wash their products, it makes a massive different difference. There's usually more impact on the environment from what we do as consumers with our clothes than the production and the shipping of the products. Um, so it's important for us to take care with that. However, in our research, we found that um, people struggled to understand wash care instructions or didn't bother to read them. Um, and that impact cannot be understated really. So overall, we found that consumers needed more education, more access to repair that's um, affordable. And in our initial study, we found perhaps not surprisingly, that um, customers either disposed of their products if they were broken or in some way needed repair or gave them to, I quote, an older female relative or friend um, who was expected to be the person who, who might fix them. And it would be great if actually all levels of, of society could be engaged in that through education. Next slide, please. So um, a key thing for us to encourage moving more into this, this broken part of um, the circular economy, the bit that we can fix or enhance, looking at reuse, recycling and disposal. Um, and certainly some of the speakers today are going to talk more about how that can happen in practice. So we found that consumers were very variable in deciding on um, what they did with used clothes um, as different people or even for a single person having a, a different kind of hierarchy of disposal methods. So the more expensive goods might go to relatives and friends um, and then the ones that were seen as uh, of less value um, were perhaps sent to uh, secondhand shops, etc. 
Clothing might be disposed of before the end of its useful life, very frequently in the case of um, fast fashion. And uh, yeah, there are stories about that from the research that we've done. Um, RAP, which is um, a government body, um, looks into a variety of different aspects of sustainability and particularly reuse and proposes that that, that could, of course, be improved. Um, and it's the responsibility of many different people, really, not just consumers, but also local governments, private companies, brands and retailers that can help us um, to engage more with that circular economy. Next slide, please. So we uh, aim to encourage more circular um, organisational or business models overall. And obviously some of those ways might be through higher exchange or libraries, which are becoming more popular. Um, and we recommend that companies might want to relook at their mission statements instead of just thinking of themselves as um, selling products made from textiles. Uh, perhaps it's providing usage, which might use some of these different options. Next slide, please. So there's some examples there. There are lots of clothes exchanges um, going on. Uh, clothes renting is becoming a popular business model as well. Um, and a very interesting one there from Freitag, which some of you might have come across, um, bags that are made from used lorry tarpaulins, which who would have expected that would make a quite luxury um, high-end product. And they've set up a system which is uh, the equivalent of Tinder for bags, where you find somebody who you can swap a bag with. Um, if you've got bored of it, you can exchange it with someone else because they are so long lasting. Next slide, please. So we have lots of um, challenges and opportunities um, that we can look at. And I think what we need to do from my experience and from the research we've done, we need to try and break down the barriers between organisations so that we can aim to work together to share the best practice. Um, and we need to aim to change unsustainable habits, albeit gradually um, from uh, consumers and organisations so that we all play a part in doing this together. Um, and to overcome those challenges, I think there are lots of opportunities for collaboration in order to make that happen between different companies, um, different products or service sectors, so that we can encourage links, for example, between industry and education. Next slide, please. So um, having been asked to consider how we might move towards a circular economy, I've now um, adapted the model that I put at the beginning, which is what I would usually teach with, and thinking, how does that actually link up? So it's got the same elements here, moving from raw materials at the top through to yarn suppliers, um, fabric manufacturers, product manufacturers, through to retailers, and then including consumers as part of this, because we have to take responsibility. Um, and then also I've added in an extra arrow to say consumers could actually give their products back to retailers we know that some companies are starting to do this um, and therefore they can go back into that circular economy and extend um, the life cycle. So I'll just mention Browngart and McDonough here because uh, they came up with this, con with this concept of cradle to cradle, um, which I I'm sure has been used for many years actually, but they, um, they defined it and talked about it in their book. Um, can I have the next slide please, Joe. So in conclusion, there are lots of opportunities that we have to improve circularity in fashion and textiles. I think we just need to look at ways of making those happen in practice. And the support of senior management we found was absolutely crucial um, in our research in looking into companies to do this. And I believe that jointly all the stakeholders are responsible. So whether they're manufacturing, retailing, suppliers who work between manufacturers and retailers, um, us as, as consumers, our governments, um, and any other stakeholders involved need to consider that they're jointly responsible. Um, and if I can see the next slide, please, Joe. Um, so from this, I've put links through to the reports that I've mentioned from our own research, but I've also added, if Joe could perhaps whiz through the, the next slides, um, references that I've referred to, and then also being a lecturer, I've given you some extra reading there. 
but it's entirely up to you in this case if you want to do it but just a, a library of sources that you might want to look at that I think are particularly useful on this topic some of which are free to access uh, some of which are academic journals um, and then if you could just show us the next slide please Joe. Um, I've added more detail there about how we went about the research that we did for DEFRA, so I, I won't talk through all of that, but if anybody does want to um, talk to me afterwards, then please do feel free to get in touch and, um, and I can run through that with you. So thank you, that's, that's it for today. Helen, thank you so much for that. Um, you made me chuckle when you said being a lecturer, I've given you some extra reading. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, yeah, wonderful overview, uh, stage by stage of um, the, the circular economy, the lifestyle. I like how your presentation was circular. You finished where you ended up, so that was quite nice. And yes, right into the uh, different potential business models and the responsibilities of both consumers and organizations. Um, just stay with us a second, Helen. Um, uh, we're just going to run um, another poll, um, so I think Stephen's going to organise that for us, just so we can learn more about um, our attendees um, that are with us today. Um, I just want to ask you a quick question, Helen, and I, I do need to be careful not to encroach really on the talks of our next speakers. So it's less about the circular economy, but more of a, I, I'm, I'm interested what, what drew you as an academic? Um, to studying the circular economy as part of your portfolio of research? Um, I think I could see that it, it was a key trend and that it was really important and it's something that I want to get involved in. I don't see it as a short-term trend. It's going to have to be a, a longer-term thing. And I came across some very interesting academics who influenced me and who I now collaborate with. Um, as I say, people from industry inspired me initially, but I knew that I could do research that would therefore make a difference and that it wasn't just going to languish away um, in, in an academic journal somewhere. So yeah, want, wanted to make a difference. And on that note, I'll also mention that as a result of the latest DEFRA project that we did, we put together a very practical toolkit for designers and product developers um, that unfortunately was held up while the government were busy with something or other for the last four years. Um, and then eventually released, uh, released this information. Uh, so we have a very useful toolkit, though I say it myself, um, that companies can use to, uh, to look more at clothing longevity. So any people who are here today, or if you've got contacts that are interested in that, do get in touch with me and we'll look at how we can um, use that with you. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that, Helen. Um, the answers to the poll are in. So the, the question was, how would you rate your knowledge of the circular economy? Um, nobody said they knew nothing but wanted to find out more, which is which is good. <laughs> at least at least the um, at least the knowledge is uh, disseminating through society. Well, the majority of people uh, answered with I have a solid understanding and act on some things. Um, about a quarter of you said you were a pro. 20% um, said they've watched the Ellen MacArthur videos um, and 15% have said um, they've heard the term but don't know how it applies to textiles and fashion. Um, great, thank you so much. We're going to have a, a couple more questions as we go along um, but for now I think it's time to introduce our second panellist of today um, who is Jennifer Davies. Um, she's the co-founder of Nabil Nayal who are a high-end fashion company with celebrity clients such as Lady Gaga, Rihanna and Florence Welsh. Um, Nabil Nayal keeps sustainability at the core of everything they do and they're very much at the frontier of implementation of the circular economy as well as new technological practices such as uh, 3D printing. Uh, Jen is also undertaking a, a PhD uh, researching how supply chain 4.0 technologies may impact sustainability and help to create new business models in what is undoubtedly uh, a complex and highly unregulated uh, industry. Um, she's has lots of years of experience as a commercial director, securing and overseeing global strategy um, and contracts with prestigious luxury retailers, such as Selfridges, 
Harvey Nichols and Dover Street Market. So without further ado, Jen, can I you ask can. you the mic, so to speak? Thank you for that lovely introduction. I was going to introduce myself, but you did a far nicer one than I was going to do for myself, so thank you. Um, so yeah, today I wanted to talk to you about developing a business case for you know sustainability, but particularly circular economy. And I wanted to share some insights from my research, which focuses on the luxury fashion sector. I think a lot of the time when we hear about sustainability, it's often in association with uh, fast fashion, but actually luxury fashion, uh, a lot of the time evades scrutiny when it should perhaps be receiving it more. You know, it's it's responsible for the, the fashion cycle, for driving the trends. It's not been without um, its fair share of sustainability related scandals, such as burning excess stock. I think some of you may be aware of Burberry having been in the press for that in recent history. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to share some insights today. So um, Joe, if I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. So when we talk about formulating a business case for sustainability or circular economy, these are a list of the key drivers. So cost and cost reduction, which is a maybe a, a low hanging fruit when it comes to drivers because it creates a win-win situation. Um, if you can reduce costs and be sustainable at the same time, then great. Um, but risk and risk reduction, sales and profit margin, reputation and brand value, attractiveness as an employer and innovative capabilities. Um, in addition to these, there are also other factors to consider, and these are enablers and favorable conditions which may support a transition to circularity and therefore aid in business case development. And these can include things such as supply chain collaboration, digital technologies, and I'm particularly interested in how that's going to develop with the you know, emerging industry 4.0. Um, situation and also government regulation can can enable and and sort of influence conditions. Um, so Joe, if I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. Some of you may already be familiar with the Fixing Fashion report. Um, it was a, a government, well, sorry, a, a UK parliamentary inquiry into the fashion industry. Um, and the report was published last year, and they said that given the stark scientific warnings we face on climate change and biodiversity loss, we must reinvent fashion. Fashion that saves resources and energy, minimizes plastic pollution, reduces waste, and thrives uses a more circular business model. New economic models that rely on sharing or renting rather than ownership are emerging. Annoyingly, or frustratingly, I should say, um, 18 recommendations were put forward to the government in this report, all of which were rejected, which sparked quite a lot of outrage within the industry. Uh, next slide, please, Joe. However, despite that, um, there are signs of a more hopeful future and a transition towards more circular models. Just recently, Selfridges have launched their first in-house rental collection, which I think is a real landmark moment for luxury fashion. Um, and Selfridges have actually really been quite pioneering with a lot of elements related to sustainability. But this is the first step, you know, that has really taken a very visible move towards uh, a more circular model. Whether this has been accelerated due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the way that it's impacted retail in general, who knows, but I think it's a positive step forward. Um, in addition, that's not featured on the slide, but some of my research has also uh, encountered situations with suppliers who are looking at circularity through hydroponics for fibers and all manner of things. So there are positive uh, elements to this and, and we are moving forward. Next slide, please, Joe. And a lot of this is being driven by a new wave of design talent. Um, I think I interviewed one of the co-founders of a well-known fashion industry NGO who is also deeply passionate about education of young design talent. And they commented upon a shift in the attitude of young design graduates over the past five years. 
and that increasingly young designers have a clear set of personal values relating to sustain sustainability that they are unwilling to compromise on. Um, so as you can see from the quote, five years ago, they wanted to be Prada, but now they don't. So that's why I have hope. And interestingly, she, they commented that, you know, these guys are not going to enter the big fashion houses that they wanted to disrupt, which leads me on to my next point. And if I could have the next slide, please, Joe. Um, so sorry, this was a, a, another example quote of one of the luxury brand owners and designers that I interviewed who had actually taken several seasons out of the fashion cycle to rework their entire business model and work towards a more you know, circular way of working. Next slide, please, Joe. But this isn't just being you know, impacting the SME end of the market. This is impacting um, larger employees as well. So this was a supply chain director of a large luxury brand. So when I joined, it was, a, it was quite a hot brand. Everybody wanted to work there. I think there was an undercurrent of, well, we don't really need to invest in our people because if you don't want the job, 10 other people will do it. But we've not been that hot recently and we've had to really think again about how we motivate and give passion to that workforce. So they were very clear about um, the requirement the, these days for brand purpose alignment and that actually their team was highly motivated by things such as the circular economy. So it goes to show it's not just design talent, it's HR talent across all business functions. Um, so we're seeing a shift in what we term as professionalization or standards which develop through the education of professionals. Next slide, please, Joe. One of the big drivers is obviously cost reduction. Um, and whilst this is obviously an active um, sort of challenge for, for many brands, and retailers, um, it actually sometimes happens or sustainability happens as a result of, of working within certain constraints. Um, so for some, it was merely a consequence of having to work within financial budget limitations, for example. Um, some felt that smaller luxury brands by default were more sustainable or more circular than, than the larger luxury brands just because of the conditions that they had to, to work in. Uh, next slide, please, Joe. So some of the business case challenges for sustainability in general and circular economy um, is implementing theory into practice. I think, you know, Helen mentioned a lot about how we need to have like a practical focus and understand the challenges of practitioners. And as somebody who's run businesses myself, I know how difficult it can be um, because often these things require time and energy and sometimes cost more money. And sometimes as a small, particularly as a smaller brand, you're just trying to survive financially. Um, so these were a couple, I've had several quotes, but these were a couple that I picked out. So uh, you get told to be responsible, to buy biodegradable things, to recycle, and then you start a company and you don't do anything of this. For your own personal life, it's easy to maintain, but for the company, it's a big, big effort. I would never wear polyester myself. Suddenly I have polyester in the collection because it's glittery. Quite a candid um you know, response, but I think an important one that, um, you know, and, and some of the designers I spoke with, they said that they felt that the way that the fashion cycle is currently geared up um, doesn't allow for them to take time out to research these things. And even when they do try and research these things, transparency in the supply chain is a big, big problem. So you can see here um, from the other illustrative quote that it was very hard to track where fabrics are from and learn about um, the fabrics that are being used for collections. Next slide, please, Joe. Just finally, I mean, it's incredibly complex. And I'm sure as Helen probably felt the same, you could go down so many different routes and avenues with this, but I've tried to pick out uh, the key things from industry that I think present the biggest challenges. And another one is um, consumer demand. And whilst there is a reported shift in consumer attitudes, it's quite unclear as yet as the strength of that. Um, and quite a few designers and other um, sort of institutional actors that I interviewed had differing views on this. And some felt that actually the way that consumer demand was being 
reported within industry wasn't representative of the actual demand and that they were unsure. So if you can see here, the luxury retail expert, I don't know if sustainability is important to them. I don't think it is to be quite frank with you. I mean, I don't think it's important enough anyway for it to make a significant difference. So there's obviously still a lot to be done here. And again, Helen touched upon this. It's about education, raising awareness, um, you know, and there's discussions to be had about who is responsible for driving that. Um, but just finally, Joe, if I could have my, my last slide, please. The final thing I wanted to talk about is supply chain collaboration. Um, I think the way that the luxury fashion industry is geared up makes even what should be relatively straightforward business case drivers um, quite challenging. So a, a luxury garment manufacturer that I interviewed had taken a very proactive approach towards sustainability and had invested in certain uh, technological manufacturing capabilities with the aim of reducing studio waste and subsequent cost. However, due to the nature of the industry, uh, they were unable to use it 80% of the time, which was obviously a massive source of frustration for them. So, you know, they said there's no bigger vision for the future, mainly because I think in general, there is no loyalty with the brands. No one knows what's going to happen from season to season. There is no security. There is no reassurance. So I guess I'd just like to, to finish by saying um, that from like a, a supply chain theory perspective, luxury fashion products in particular are categorized as innovative products, which are uh, characterized by being unpredictable, high variety with short product life cycles. And these products are usually associated with what we call agile supply chain structures. Um, there is a perceived incompatibility between innovative products and lean supply chain management principles, such as improving efficiency and minimizing waste, which are far better aligned with the objectives of sustainability and, and circular economy. Um, but there might be ways in which we can work towards hybrid supply chain structures that help to address these problems. So in a nutshell, that is it. Thank you, Joe. I think that's my last slide. Jen, thank you so much for that. Jen's a good friend of mine and she, uh, she never lets us down. Um, just while I have a brief chat with Jen, uh, can we run the third poll, please, Stephen? Um, and we'll see what the answers come back with on that. Um, some of the things I picked up on um, on what you said, Jen, you know, the UK government rejecting all 18 recommendations. Yeah. I, I, the work that I do, you know, you, you know, policy and governments are so important. And it really does seem like we're facing an uphill battle if all 18 recommendations are, are rejected you know I, I was really intrigued to um to listen to what you said about uh, this new wave of design talent and if i remember correctly 18 percent of our audience on this webinar are designers so no pressure guys but but we're counting on you um it's, it's the other thing that that I, I'd, I'd love for you to maybe we should do it at the end but, but we can do, maybe do it a little bit now but you really highlighted the complexity for me of the various tensions that are in place. So you have a tension between what you choose to do as an individual, i.e. not use or wear polyester because it's glittery, but then what you are forced to do as, as, uh, as a professional, as part of your organization. And then the other, the other tension between, you know, dealing with luxury customers and sustainability being important, but the triangle isn't linked up because they, don't seem to care. I mean, how do how do we increase the moral intensity on sustainability with luxury customers? Can can we? I mean, that's going to be one of the key challenges. And as Helen touched upon and I touched upon in my presentation, it is about education. It's about you know changing perspectives and viewpoints. And if, I think food is a, a good example. You know, the whole fair trade movement when that started people thought it was ludicrous that um you know people would never pay more for a cup of coffee because it was produced you know because the coffee beans had been produced in fair conditions whereas now we don't think anything of it so i think there is an element of time and persistence and you know everybody coming together and trying to break down these barriers so i think that's the that's the way forward really yeah agreed agreed um 
so we have the results of our third poll at the moment. Whose responsibility is it to make industry um, more circular? And um, the overwhelming, well, not overwhelming, <laughs> the majority of you a third um, put it down to, to governments. This was next, followed by retailers um, at 30%. And then uh, coming behind that, we have consumers and, and designers. Waste industry, uh, interestingly, received no votes and neither did the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, but I think that was a bit of a, um, a, a jest answer from us there. Um, I'm going to introduce our third panelist. So this is going to be Ross Barry. Uh, Ross is the director of LMB Textile Recycling and chair of the Cyclotex Group. So if this places him at the forefront of garments and textile recycling in the UK, um, they're responsible for collecting and processing textile waste from councils, waste companies, communities and schools. So Ross um, today is going to enlighten us on the barriers facing textiles at the end of life um, and how they move to becoming circular. So Ross, can I um, hand over the virtual mic to yourself? Yeah, thank you very much, Oliver. And you've done a great job of sort of getting rid of my first slide. So Joe, if you can move to the next one. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so as Oliver just alluded to, Recyclatex is a trading group of nine members. We've looked, we've got 500 years worth of experience between us. You tend to find um, textile merchants such as ourselves are fairly small family-run companies. As such, we work together and offer national collection systems for retailers, charities, and what have you, based on sort of geography. Um, I think at this point, it's probably worth mentioning, if anyone's looking to investigate a lot more into our industry, the Textile Recycling Association, which is um, more of the political public body for our industry as such, it represents charities and what have you so if you've got any questions there Alan Wheeler is always a good one to direct them to at the Textile Recycling Association. Um, I think also this sort of 500 years experience between us I think goes to show that as an industry we've been here a very long time you know and trace the roots back of collecting clothing um, to Roman times and if you go on to the next slide for us please Joe you've got the traditional image there of you know the old rag and bone man which doesn't give me an excuse to be my and sun impression but when you sort of talk to people they do seem to have this image of our industry of either rag and bone men or you know they just don't really know that we're there we sort of sit behind the scenes um most people often associate textile recycling with the charity sector and in some ways that's a slightly uk centric thing the um, charity sector in the uk is absolutely huge and You've got the textile banks out on streets. You've also got charity shops, which, you know, is really brilliant. And as a country, we've got a really high recycling and reuse rate. Um, miles in front of uh, the United States, um, Europe's catching up with us, but we still are global leaders in that area. Um, but a lot hasn't really changed in the last sort of 50 years or so. You know, the horse and carts now, a van or a lorry, um, but the system's very much similar. We sort of collect the clothing, it'll come back to a factory, it'll be reprocessed, and we will grade it for what's re-wearable or reusable. So that will tend to be exported abroad, predominantly sub-Saharan Africa, but the Middle East and other countries where there isn't traditionally the access to new clothing at affordable rates. So a lot of people have this misconception that charities like Oxfam or Salvation Army sell everything within the charity shop. That's actually the case. You tend to find only about 10% of the clothing sold in store. And that's for various reasons. A lot of it is quite simply, you know, people in the UK have access to cheap clothing. They don't need to be buying it from the charity shops, but the charity shops are there to provide a service and an excellent fundraiser for the charity. So um, what tends to happen is you've got companies such as ourselves which will have contracts with the charities and we we'll clear their shops and process it. Um, at the moment, you tend to find there's about 50% split between recycling and reuse. Um, the recycling does tend to be downcycling, so very basic if it's cotton-based material, quite often it just end up cut into square pieces and used as a cleaning cloth. Um, 
fibre recycling, I'll go on to in a little bit more, but again, a lot of it does just get shredded. So it's pulled back to fibre, then it's squished and it's used as insulation in your car. If you split open your mattress, you're going to find a lot of grey material in there. That's reclaimed wool from jumpers and what have you. Um, still happens in the UK, but a lot of it now is getting exported abroad. Um, what we are finding recently is as fast fashion clothing consumptions increased, um, there's only so many mattresses and beds you can fill with this old material and we've got to look at other alternatives. So we're hitting market saturation there. If you could go on to the next slide, please, Joe. Um, just here to talk about the figures a little bit more. So as you can see, on average, we collect 26 or we wear 26.7 kilos of clothing a year that we buy. There's still a million tonnes of clothing thrown away each year. So it's sent to landfill or incineration, you know, a million tons. Um, so if you go on to the next slide, I'm gonna try and help you get your head around those figures a bit. So everyone loves a big picture of sort of old clothes. That is about five tons worth of clothes. Um, so if you think about it, if it was all loose and not bowed up, that'd fill five transit vans or probably two big seven and a half tonners. Um, and that's 20,000 garments. So that just represents what 750 households buy each year. Um, so, you know, that's the size of a secondary school and that's what all of their clothing looks like, which is absolutely amazing when you consider it. In the UK, we're buying two garments every single week per person. Um, so no wonder, you know, this sort of talk of how can we keep this sustainability going and what does happen to the clothing. Um, if you go on to the next slide, Joe. See, look, even Ellen McCarthy's even helped us out here. So we've got a garbage truck every second sent to landfill. We've got the Empire State Building build up. We've got Sydney Harbour. So we've got every country covered with, just to give you an idea of just the amount of clothing that we're dealing with. Um, if you go onto the next slide, we're then finding out what does happen to this clothing. Our industry for the last, 30 years, 40 years, has always been very proud that we send it to Africa where it gets reworn and, you know, you extend the life cycle, people have access to clothing, you've got the benefits of trade, you know, there's a massive industry in secondhand clothing, it's probably the second or third biggest industry in most African states, so it's a big wealth generator, but what we're now beginning to find is, you know, it's a linear model that we're looking at here, if you go to Ghana, there's dumps of clothes there. Why is that? That shouldn't happen. Yes, there is a case that you know people wear clothes and they dispose of them, but clearly what is happening, clothing's so cheap these days, we're buying so much, and people are just sending clothes out there. They're not sorting it. They're not making sure that it's fit for purpose, and they're effectively dumping it abroad, which you know is absolutely terrible and really shouldn't be happening. So it's a case that we need to start looking at how we deal with that, which the circular economy has been very much on everyone's lips for the last few years. If we can have the next slide, please, Joe. But it is in some ways building on what's always been there. This is a picture. This is actually in Prato in Italy, which I don't know if anyone knows Prato. It's the home of wool uh, manufacture and spinning and fine garments. And there's a brilliant article in the Times a few weeks back in the Sunday Times just sort of exploring what happens there and interestingly the whole fiber to fiber re-spinning the mechanical process of it was kind of done behind closed doors it was a bit of a dirty secret for them because you know those taking old material sorting it by color re-spinning it re-dyeing it mixing it in with virgin material and reselling it that wasn't seen until recently as a, an amazing thing it was just something you did um, and now people are reassessing it and saying hang on this is fibre to fibre technology, it's circular economy. This is what we should be doing. The old clothing we have is a resource. We shouldn't just throw it away. Inevitably, you know, people wear out their clothes, they get holes in them. So extending the life takes us so far, but what do we do with it afterwards? Um, so our industry has always been there and we've been looking at um, downcycling, upcycling, recycling, and it's getting exciting now because I think, especially over the last six months with the whole COVID, people have sort of reassessed what they're doing with their clothes. They've looked at their lifestyle, their choices, and we're seeing, or I'm seeing, 
brands and retailers contacting us and Berg, we were mentioned earlier about incineration you know i get a lot of emails it's like oh we might be doing this is there anything we can do and i think cynically they are doing that not because it makes financial sense perhaps for them to do that because they know consumers will push for that as we sort of sort of already said that people are making ethical choices and it will come to the point where people say unless i know the life cycle of my clothing unless there's a producer responsibility i might not choose to buy a clothing from brand x i'm going to buy it from brand y because they have taken care of their whole cycle and they've looked at what's happening so i think it's definitely getting really exciting but it's such a complicated issue if you can go to the next slide for us i'll be honest with you i do not know who put this together but it's probably rap or someone but you know, look at all of these loops of where your clothing can go. You've got this accumulation in wardrobes. And I think something that come out of the Sustainable Clothing Action Plan was this great idea of this mass accumulation in wardrobes. There was these, um, RAP did some figures on how much clothing's getting bought into the UK, how much we produce and how much is being lost. And there was a huge, I don't know, it's like a million tons of that. And they just said, well, it must be sitting in people's wardrobes and just tracking all of those different areas of where we can intercept and find out what's happening to clothing, how we can get consumers to change, whether they give it to an old woman next door, whether they sell it on eBay, whether they exchange it in for a discount on new clothing, give it to charity. There's all of these different routes. And I think where our industry can come in is we can help capture that and the big big thing for circular economy is saying right we've got this technology whether it's chemical or mechanical recycling but we're going to need all of this waste and we need the feedstock and luckily our industry is there to help supply it but to take it further you've got to get to the point where it is that circular flow and everyone knows what's happening and consumers are sort of very clear and transparent on what they should and shouldn't do. It gets very complicated when you're trying to explain to somebody, you know, don't put your clothes in the bin because somebody else will re-wear it. When they're sort of thinking to themselves, well, I don't want it. I don't know anybody else that wants it. Um, and surely somebody in Africa is not going to want it. And if you start adding in even more complicated things like what materials can be recycled, the fibre content, all of this, my view is just very much let's have an industry that can handle it, that knows how to sort it and how to process it. And then we can hopefully start getting those economies of scale up and running so that the further investment does come into um, the next stage of circular economies because it's still in the lab stage. If we go on to the next slide, you know, we're beginning to see lots of advertising, don't buy this jacket, you've got mud jeans, that for a number of years have done take back schemes. Patagonia, again, for a number of years have done their scheme where they have invested heavily in making sure that all of their clothing can be fixed and resold. Um, and this is really exciting, but it's going to be a long way before all brands start doing this. And from the brands that I talk to, they just love this idea that there might be this magic machine that you throw old clothes into and new clothes come out the other end. Um, and it's just how do we get to that point? Um, uh, there's a few examples coming forward. If Joe, you just want to go forwards on them. Um, so this scheme is, I think it's Eileen Fisher, which is a quite an interesting business model where they encourage consumers to retold, resell, resend their items back to them, and then they repair them and resell them. Um, if you go into the next one, please, Joe. Paramo do the same. Um, very much about from the start when they look at their materials they select ones that they know that they're easy to fix that can be recycled or they've got a lot of durability and their customers will pick them because they know it would last for life and their take back schemes is incredibly generous i think you get 50 pounds for every item you return and that's something that i think people perhaps now are beginning to look at is sort of yes you can buy fast fashion and turn it over quickly or are you better at looking at a garment that's going to last you a lot longer and a little bit like a car? You know, you buy certain brands because you know it's going to have a resale value in 10 years or 
other brands, you know, it's not going to have the same revalue, sale value. So it's going to cost of use is going to be a lot different. And I think that's the way people are beginning to look at it. Um, can you go to the next one, please, Joe? If anyone's interested, RAP, I know Helen's mentioned a lot of the work of RAP and DEFRA. I've just put this up here so you can see how their report on fibre to recycling is and where it's going. So we'll move on to that. And I think that is about me done. There is a few other slides. I think, Joe, there is a picture here from Hong Kong, which is that magical machine that you put clothes into and it comes out the other end. Um, I'm not entirely sure how it works and I'm hoping they're gonna bring it to the UK. But I think uh, the next speaker probably does know a lot more about this than I do. So I'm gonna leave you all there. Thank you very much. Ross, thank you so much for that. I think you've just made us all wanna go and look in our wardrobes. And, and see what's hanging up and and call it um, accumulation. No, um, yeah. I think that's been, um, it's been really, really eye-opening. You know, I, I believe that you mentioned that the UK, the UK itself are, are global leaders. Am I right? Did I remember that correctly yeah. from the beginning? But, I mean, we- That's we also, well, we're yeah. global leaders, but it's also, we do buy a lot of clothing. So in some ways you could say <laughs> we're global losers as well, but yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we should be we, celebrating we it. Yeah, we have to be global leaders, don't we? We don't have a choice. But yeah, you're right. We should, we should be celebrating it. A couple of things I picked up on. Um, did you say 10% of charity shop clothes are sold in store? The rest are um, put through different channels? Yeah, it obviously varies from charity to charity, but you do find an awful lot of it will go to other cha channels. And that is, I don't know if anyone watched Mary Porter's a good few years ago, saying that charity shops, the problem is they end up as a bit of a dumping ground. So sometimes they get a lot of donations that just aren't suitable to be sold in store. Um, but they also do get a lot of good stuff and, you know, it just doesn't sell through as quickly. Yeah, and from, from previous work that, that we've done at the Liverpool Fashion Summit, we know that charity shops are under the same pressures as every retailer. You know, that year-on-year -year profits as well. Um, you also mentioned one garbage truck every second gets gets incinerated. Um, one garbage truck of clothes gets incinerated every second. Um, I love what you said about your old clothes. You need to see them as a resource. You need to, you know, I think it's circular economy. Everything is inventory, right? And and changing mm -hmm. that changing that perspective is um, is is a tough ask. Um, I also I love the connection you made at the end between textiles and. Um, and, and automobiles, you know, it's it's almost a behavior that we already do, but we do it with cars, right? So that switch to now do it with clothes, fashion, textiles is, um, it's possible, it is possible. Yeah, I think um, it's um, clothing so cheap in real terms these days that people have disconnected it. When you sort of had to save up a week's wages to buy a suit, you bought it and held onto it. Now that you don't have to, you can buy a suit so cheaply now, you can wear it once for a wedding and throw it away. Yeah, yeah. And if, you know, if, I, know I know my grandparents, grandparents who, who paid for, or who paid for quality clothes, they got handed down and handed down and handed down. I think I've still got some of my granddad's silk ties somewhere in that wardrobe of accumulation. Um, no, thanks for that, Ross. I think um, we're going to move um, last but very much not least our final panelists for today. So uh, Dr. Ashley Holding. Ashley's the founder of uh, Circular Material Solutions um, and they help companies make the transition to circular business models. Um, he's worked with a range of businesses from startups to medium-sized uh, businesses. Um, alongside his professional work, um, Ashley's appeared in publications such as Eco Textile News, um, Fashionista, Fashionista, uh, and Green Biz as an authority on textile packaging, sustainability, and recycling. How do I say it, Ashley? Is it fashionista, fashionista? I'm, I'm not sure, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, the pronunciation aside, I, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, yeah, welcome. Um, I think Ross's presentation leads nicely into mine, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the technologies that people might start to be using to do fiber-to-fiber -fiber recycling, but I also want to, to kind of bring it back down to the Liverpool region, you know, uh, as this is part of the Liverpool Fashion Summit, and we're collaborating with the Circular Economy Clubs uh, locally. So I want to kind of bring it back to the, the city area and see how 
Liverpool could be a blueprint for a circular city. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, just a bit about myself and my company. Uh, we have two business units really, which are research and development uh, and consultancy generally in the area of innovation in sustainable uh, and circular textiles and fashion. My background is in, is in chemistry, materials and polymer science, green chemistry. So I bring this kind of technical background and I've worked with um, the startup in this area. I've worked at an industry accelerator. So I have quite a wide uh, view of this field. Uh, next slide, please. Um, some of this uh, segs into what uh, Ross has been talking about, but these are the kind of scenes that you might have seen before. Um, this is a textile recycling bank uh, in West London during the, the COVID pandemic early this year. Uh, and all over Europe, this was happening where the clothes are just piling up at textile recycling banks. Local authorities just can't take them in anymore. Um, this whole supply chain is broken down. Um, but generally, there's a lot of textile waste. Um, it's getting more difficult to actually find a market for these. Maybe this is something that uh, Ross has experienced. Um, things like declining export markets have been cited as a reason for this, but also the declining quality of the clothes for resale and repair, as we've talked about. Uh, more fast fashion, uh, garments which are designed to be disposable, uh, becoming kind of a larger fraction of this waste stream. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there's a few stats here. You might have seen some of these before. Um, we have talked about uh, export and, and reuse of garments, which of course is a very good thing. Uh, EU-wide, there's something like 50% of garments which are actually exported. But then when you look at the end of life of textiles is where you start to see a, a different picture. So obviously, even when you, you reuse them, they will still have an ultimate end of life. They're gonna end up somewhere. And today, the majority of where this ends up is either in a landfill or in an incinerator. And there's some nice figures, but there's one figure here, which was uh, it was in a, a Dutch government report, which is that 100 billion dollars worth of material is thrown away every year. Uh, of, the, of some of the, of the rest of this, you know, it's, it's a mighty, tiny, tiny, tiny fraction, which is um, closed loop recycled. This is mostly things like wool and cotton, which are very, very um, high grade in places like Italy. Uh, and the majority of the rest of that is, is downcycled. So as we met, we've heard before, things like rags, wipers, stuffing, things like that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but there's, al there's also another angle to this, which is the materials usage itself. So when you're looking at the product level view of things, um, generally when you're looking at recycled materials, they do offer a lower carbon alternative. Um, there's one example here of the breakdown of a carbon impact of a polyester t-shirt. So this is specific to polyester. But we can see here uh, the pet production. PET is, is, a, is polyethylene terephthalate. It's the, the main polymer, which is what we know as polyester. Um, and that's the biggest you know, chunk of the impact right there. So if you can reduce the dependence on this petroleum sourced um, intensive material, uh, that's, that's one of the largest parts of the impact. But of course, there are also other things which are important. So things like the consumer use, how you launder um, your garment, if you, if you wash it quite a lot at, at a high temperature that adds to the impact, but also things like the spinning, the weaving, the wet treatment of the textile is also really important. It's something which really isn't uh, looked at too much. But generally, uh, when, when you want to look at some kind of fiber to fiber recycling, um, it is reasonable to say that there is enough material sitting in our wardrobe, sitting in landfills, uh, to basically meet the demand that we have for materials, right? It's, it's there, it's a resource which we can think of almost as a mine of resources to be used. Um, so things like the impact of polyester production, uh, cotton cultivation can all be reduced if you're looking at recycling it uh, long-term. Next slide, please. And I'm just gonna focus a little bit on polyester. We've, we've got limited time. We could also talk about say Lozix and cotton, but here's one example of why it's really a good idea to be looking at closely recycling, uh, specifically fiber to fiber recycling of polyester. So as we mentioned, PET, the, the polymer which makes a polyester, um, there's a huge market for it, of course, worldwide. Um, and the majority of it actually goes into textiles. Um, the rest of it goes into bottles and packaging. So we know clear plastic water bottles, that's the same plastic that is, is making up the clothes polyester. Um, but we obviously, we're seeing a lot of people sourcing their polyester fiber now to be recycled. They just, just recycle polyester quite often. But often there's not a lot of understanding from consumers of what that actually is. But the vast majority of this, in fact, nearly all of it is polyester, which comes from 
bottles and nearly always it's a very small subset of water bottles very clear not with, even with carbonated uh, water sometimes so the key thing to, to, to think about here is that you know we're we're only recycling a very very small fraction of the material which actually exists on the market and we're not recycling textiles basically at all in, in a closed loop so the vast you know the vast bulk of it is not recycled yet we want to source it from the smaller fraction of material which is bottles in in combination with the bottle industry needing this material you know, there's EU regulations coming in which are mandating bottle companies to use recycled content. The fashion industry doesn't have the same pressure. So there is a, a competition for this feedstock and, and long term, you know, it's just not a, a sustainable proposition. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just, just to go into potential technologies that, that we can look at to do this kind of fiber to fiber recycling. Uh, Ross touched upon a few. Um, so I, I've split it down into molecular, polymer and fiber level. Um, so fiber level is, is, is a typical kind of what is known as mechanical recycling, where you essentially just shred the material, you, you turn it and twist it back into yarn again, and make new clothes. But this is, this is generally only limited to certain kinds of textiles, things like cotton, wool, not usually uh, blended with too many different things, uh, usually pre-consumer waste from cutting factories and things like that. Um, but the output of this is a yarn. Um, you don't have much kind of to go in, in terms of energy uses and things like that. So if you can do this, you know, it's a good idea to do this, uh, especially if the waste is, is kind of close to where you're actually manufacturing things. Um, but there are also other levels as well. You can, you can take it back down to the polymer level. Um, this is also known as mechanical recycling, but in a different way, which is using heat basically to melt synthetics. That's one way to do it, um, but also to use what they call solvents. So something which dissolves something. Um, for example, to dissolve cotton and spin a rayon type fiber. So that's another way you can think of extracting the polymer from the waste, but not degrading it or breaking it down. Um, and then the last level is, is the molecular level. So you're actually breaking down the polymers that make up the textiles into their constituent parts. So these are sometimes called monomers, but the molecular building blocks that make up, for example, polyester, nylon, and another new emerging biosynthetics, for example, can, can be done with. The problem is there's always a trade-off in these technologies. Some are good for certain types of feedstocks, some are good for other types of feedstocks, but generally you have to really think about what the lowest impact way to, to recycle uh, in a circular method there is. And once you kind of go down the scale and going back to the molecular level, you're using more energy because you have, you have further to go back to the original material. So you're using energy every time you have to, for example, make the polymer, every time you have to melt it and extrude it, um, and all those kind of things. So you really need to do the least impact thing you can to the material. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so there are a number of different technologies in development. I don't want to get you know, too deep into the different ones and, and what they do and what the pros and cons are. But as a field, there are a few things we can extrapolate about what the challenges are. Um, I've broken it down into two, which are technical and, and systemic challenges. Um, technically, there's, there's quite a few challenges, and, and some of these aren't often talked about openly. Um, things like separation of additives, dyes, coatings, and separating the fiber blends are all kind of well-known challenges, and different technologies approach these in different ways. Things like the purification and purity of the products, um, depending on the technology, especially depolymerization technologies where you're breaking it down into its molecular level, it's really tricky to actually get really, really pure uh, commodity chemicals out of the thing you're breaking down. So that's, that's a big challenge for anybody. Uh, process yields, so actually taking the, the feedstock and, and converting in the highest percentage possible, um, even above 90% is, is quite tricky. So you're always going to lose some material. But also the energy usage, as, as I mentioned, the more intense the process in terms of heat, pressure, um, electricity usage, things like that, um, it's going to be a, a higher carbon uh, method. Uh, and the kind of process chemicals that are used, you need to make sure it's recovered in a closed loop. Um, but there are also systemic challenges to really pushing this whole industry forward. And generally, I would say that one of the biggest ones is just a lack of demand. Uh, this is, you know, can be contributed to a lot of factors. Of course, there are a subset of uh, consumers who are interested in, in sustainable garments. But for example, as I mentioned, with the packaging industry, there's not really this big push on the legislation front to actually 
force a level playing field for brands and manufacturers so they can actually all invest in this without kind of fear that they're spending money or they're not kind of uh, competing at a level playing field. Um, also a big lack of investment, uh, many reasons for this, lack of understanding, uh, the risk you know, that, that is perceived because of the technologies, but also tied to the other things that the lack of perceived demand as well. Um, also generally, this is something I see a lot, is really a lack of knowledge in the industry, so in brands, manufacturers, um, about what these technologies are, how they differ, um, how to compare them against each other, um, but also that the industry itself is very fragmented. You have many, many different people involved in a manufacture of a garment, individual dye houses and treatment houses, spinning uh, the polymer production, uh, the garment manufacturer itself. Uh, and the fact that this is all often is coming from the top down. So big brands are the ones who are looking at this. Um, you know, they're very slow moving. Um, they often require long kind of decision times. And when innovators are working with these kind of people, it's not always uh, the easiest thing to do. Um, so these are a bunch of factors which kind of come together right now to, to mean it is kind of difficult. Uh, but if we start to tackle each of these things individually, um, then I think we can make some progress. Um, next slide, please. So the other thing I want you to think about is, um, is you know, we have a sustainability angle and, and this ties into it, but also um, thinking about the lifetime or the, the life cycle of a garment right from when the, the raw material comes from. Um, so not only is it quite wasteful and inefficient and, and uh, not very sustainable, of course, at the moment. Um, so for example, you might have for a polyester garment, you have oil, which is extracted in the Middle East might be sent to someone like China to make polyester um, garments, sorry, the, the threads and the textiles. It might be sent to South Asia um, for making the garments, then shipped to Europe um, where we buy it. Uh, then it might be exported to Africa, as we've seen this 90% of garments being exported. And then it might meet its ultimate end of life, uh, for example, in Africa, where the, the local uh, economy is less developed in terms of, of waste management. Um, so I wanted to propose uh, something different, um, something which brings it back to the local level. And I think maybe this is a challenge to um, the Northwest, the people of Liverpool uh, who might be watching or other cities in the UK who, who want to be leaders in this field. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so I, I think it would be great if we, if we well, somewhere in the UK at least, we founded a circular textile city. So we really try and bring everything in the ecosystem into one place. So we, you know, we've talked about the retail angle previously, uh, waste collectors as well, but actually bringing some of these fiber to fiber technologies, even if they're just on the pilot scale, um, as well as the textiles and yarn production, there is an industry in the UK um, and garment manufacture all in one place. Um, and this also cuts out some of the inefficiencies we've seen with, with the supply chain spanning the whole globe. You know, a lot of the impact as we've seen is also in the the manufacture and the weaving where the power sources that are used uh, don't have as much renewable energy in the mix um, and you use kind of coal boilers and things like that. Um, so really bringing this all in one place, kind of um, showing an example to the rest of the world, to the rest of the UK, um, how this could be done, I think could be a really interesting idea. And it's also, you know, the feedstock, as I mentioned, it, it exists already. We have enough waste to meet the demand for our materials and the technologies exist or in development that can actually make use of it. You know, the other benefits, economic, bringing back jobs, bringing the, the textile industry, for example, back to the Northwest England, um, diverting the waste from the landfills um, and also making the economy more resilient. This is something we've seen with uh, the COVID-19 crisis. Um, when you rupture the supply chain, it becomes a lot more difficult to, to everybody working in it, right from retailers up to manufacturers. So having it all in one place, where the feedstock never disappears, um, the chain is not easy to break. Um, next slide, please. I just had a, a short suggestion on how this could be done, but I think what we really need to do is start by identifying what the current situation is. I and mean, there are some studies out there, um, you know, as we've seen the RAP report, for example, uh, but going down at the local level, um, what feedstock exists. So next slide, please. Um, and I just want to finish with some questions for the Liverpool city region. Maybe people who work for the city or the local authorities know these things, but I think it would be nice to get a baseline understanding of actually what the current situation is. So things like how much textile waste do you actually produce per year? And where does it actually come from? Is it 
mostly solving the UK? Uh, is it coming from abroad? Um, what the overall fiber composition is? This is very important, not only for the total composition, but how the individual breakdown of garments is. Are they polycotton blends? Are they wool and acrylic blends? You know, what, what's the challenges there? Um, also, who are the collectors who's involved in the, in the supply chain in this region? Um, the thoughts and experiences of the local citizens. I think that's something our, uh, Helen has been talking about with, with the service that they've done. Um, but also who's involved, what brands uh, are involved locally, what retailers um, uh, are involved in the supply chain who could kind of make this circular city idea happen. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's my suggestion of, of what can be done to, to kickstart things. This brings together the kind of idea of investment, um, the supply chain disconnectedness, um, the need actually to just demonstrate and pilot the, the ideas that have been worked on. Um, so yeah, that's, um, that's what I have to say. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, if you're interested to, to learn more, just to have a chat, please reach out to me. Uh, email or LinkedIn or the website. And uh, if you're interested in consulting services, or we do a lot of work and reports, uh, research and development work, things like that. So um, yeah, thank you. Ashley, thank you so much for that. And you've, you've, you've set it up perfectly for, for what I was just about to suggest. Um, um, just before we go into um, a little bit of a chat and our Q&A, everyone who's on this if you want to do a little bit of networking introduce yourself pass on your linkedin pass on your twitter now's now's the best time to do it so do so in the chat um i think first thing that we need to do actually is answer those questions that you just gave us definitely as well not, not just the Liverpool city region but you know uh, mm. lancashire brazil new york where where we're yeah, all coming yeah. from yeah thank thank you for that joe um just while Ashley and I um, have, a, have a small chat, I think, Stephen, can we run the final poll, um, the final question? Um, there we go. Perfect. Um, so, yeah, for all the attendees, uh, when you do get uh, uh, the chance, um, please, please do uh, answer that for us. Ashley, some of the things you said, I mean, well, first of all, you said that one of the challenges is that, is that there's a lack of expert knowledge. I mean, you know, with, with yourself, with Jen, Ross, Helen, I hope that we've gone some way to solving that today. Mm. Um, I love your ideas and I love the challenges and how well do they all fit into the, the rebound or the build back better strategy after COVID-19, right? Um, mm -hmm. Loved what you said about 100 billion just getting thrown away. It's, and, you know, it's those kind of things that we need. Um, and similar to what Ross said about one garbage truck every, every second. But I think, well, well, two things. When, usually it goes over my head, but when you started talking about fiber, poly, polymer, and molecular, I mean, usually poof, right over, but you explained that so well. But I think what, what you really did is you highlighted the, the interconnectivity of the circular economy with a whole range of issues. None of this exists in a vacuum, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, as I mentioned this, you know, the supply chain spanning the whole globe. I mean, that, that's part of it as well. And there are even very small things connected to that, things like packaging, you know, just because you have to ship things across the entire world, you need plastic packaging, for example, even though it's a small part of the pie, it's another thing which kind of adds on to the whole impact of the life cycle of a garment. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, as, as, as I mentioned before, we've now got COVID to deal with mm -hmm. as well. And so, does that increase the demand for the circular economy? I'm not really too sure. You mentioned um, energy in terms of the recycling process with those three different types of recycling. Mm -hmm. um, so it's all connected and it, it, would, uh, it would be good for us as consumers, us as businesses and us as, um, as pressure on governments as well to remember that. Um, so um, I think just before we, we close the poll, um, I would just like to remind everyone that um, we are going to stay on for just a little while longer. And this is your opportunity to ask any questions on any of the topics that we may or may not have covered um, this afternoon or, or, or this evening. Please do use the Q&A function. Um, if you want to, you can give your name. If you don't, you can leave it anonymous. Um, if you want to, to direct it some, to someone specific, just tell us. Um, so I think we can close that poll when you're ready, Stephen. How are we doing on numbers? Oh, fantastic. It's just come up now. 
So um, the question was for the textile and fashion industries to become more circular, um, what do we need? And the majority of us, 41%, nearly half, said more government intervention. And how interesting, Jen, that you reminded us that all 18 recommendations were, were rejected. I don't know if there's anyone from the government on the webinar, but I hope there is. <laughs> um, the, the next one, 32%, was more communication and collaboration between the different facets of the industries. Then we have a few people changing business practices and uh, more innovation and technology. Only 7%. I thought that would be, um, would it be slightly higher. Um, government funding, 2%. And none of us thought it would be increased consumer demand. Um, so really interesting stuff there, especially with regard to government intervention and the lack of them taking up the, the recommendations. So I think um, at this point, Joe, can I bring you in? Joe's been, uh, there he is, Joe's been uh, dutifully listening along and, and, and clicking for us to make sure everything goes smoothly. Um, so Joe's actually going to um, host the Q&A for us. So Joe, over to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for your excellent presentations. That was a really good spread of uh, information. But uh, following on from that last poll question, and um, and yeah, the, the government not not accepting any of any of the recommendations in this new world. What what would be a bit of policy, maybe one nugget of policy that you think could bring all, all the different facets of of um, of the textiles industry together? A Ashley, you went last, so do you, do you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, I I definitely think we need some kind of um, extended producer responsibility and EPR scheme. It's been discussed in in the UK a select committee. Uh, the 1p garment levy. Um, I, maybe Ross can talk about if that would help his you know, business, but generally, yeah, the collection sorting of garments, yeah, this, this is something actually at the moment, you know, you want to set this infrastructure in place for when these fiber to fiber recycling technologies will mature. But if you want to do it right now, that, you know, there's not a lot of demand for the, the outcomes of, of these, let's say an automated textile recycling facility. So if this whole system can be funded by the people who are producing the waste. And I think that's that's obviously a good thing. Uh, Ross, go on. Yeah, sorry. Um, so no, definitely, I think an EPR scheme's been, so, been spoken about for a number of years. Um, France has adopted one and it's worked really, really well. And I think to get brands to actually do this, some sort of levy on clothing is needed. And then it goes into the industry and gets you know, people working together. I think collaboration is actually a really big key in this to get people sharing technology and building up that sort of, you know, we're in something new here, just getting that all going. So, yeah, I think definitely an EPR would work. Jen, do you think an EPR would um, positively impact designers? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, the, the, the legislative uh, suggestions that were put forward in the fixing fashion report were were great and not unobtainable so it's disappointing that you know things like that have been rejected just what one note um one of the things that i've come across in my research um both in the existing literature and through interviews that i've conducted i think um government intervention needs to be approached with a degree of caution and um i think i'll just read a quote that i've had I think uh, that the trouble is that if the, it becomes too heavy handed with the government dictating what should be, then I'm not sure you get the right response from business. I think what the government should be doing is making it easy for businesses to adopt triple bottom line or circular economy type models. Um, and there has been existing literature which has shown like unintended consequences of regulation that it doesn't always pr produce positive effects. I think anything that is done needs to be done very much in collaboration with industry to ensure that goals that we are striving towards are actually achievable. So it's more investment in certain facets of the industry to 
Too yeah, big. I think the government has a large responsibility to facilitate that. Um, I think, you know, in, in investing in, in research connected to this is extremely important. And I don't think we see enough of it. And um, one of the other things that was put forward was that the government needed to be investing in how we are using emerging technologies to advance all of these things. And we're, we're not getting enough in the way of support in our industry. So, um, you know, but there's, there's plenty we can all, all be doing ourselves without depending on the government. And Helen, do you have any notes for? Anyone? Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's really important. And I think there must be more responsibility for the brands and retailers that are churning out products, going out there into the environment and knowing that they have to consider what happens afterwards. And I think a lot of the points that Ashley made there show how if you're producing something that has all kinds of different components in it, it can have such an impact on the environment and reusability, recycling, etc. And why designers are absolutely central um, to that. I think making the point at, at the start um, is essential. And then you know whether or not you can take more responsibility. Um, and I think if companies had that, they had to do that, um, they would really consider much more at that starting point. So um, I just wanted to add as well, going back to the government responsibilities, there has been a parliamentary select committee two weeks ago that has started to look um, at fast fashion again. And clearly it's, well, I'm guessing anyway, it's been prompted by the problems in Leicester, which were at the heart of the COVID outbreak here. So I think that, um, that's even though they're looking at it for an entirely different reason at least something is moving on there and they did ask for academic input on that so hopefully that might indicate that there's a little bit of movement there thank you um within the industry there are things like the um in ross's presentation there was a picture of the h m uh, machine in in hong kong this kind of magical solution that's going to solve everyone's problems um so two part two parts of the question one is this going to result you know is this a magical machine that can change the industry and if it to a greater or lesser extent if it is how will manufacturers and retailers and, and designers access these what is the communication is there is there a resource or a, a um, forum for people or a, a mechanism for people to access these new recycled materials I mean, I wouldn't say there is, um, I mean, this is the problem, right? This is, uh, well, specifically on this loop, uh, loop or loop machine, as I think they call it, um, it's actually not new technology. It, it's actually alluding again to this kind of mechanical recycling that uh, we saw of the wool mills in Italy, right? This technology has been around for like a hundred years already. It's just a small version of it. So it's, it's kind of limited in, in what you can do with it. Usually cotton and wool and natural fiber blends and things like that. Um, but yeah, it's not, it's not that easy. Of course you get recycled polyester from bottles, uh, recycled nylon from the econile process. There's a few big ones out there, but, um, and there were, you know, a few suppliers that people can source recycled fabrics from, but it's not like, um, yeah, there's not like a central repository or anything like that. So, um, you have to dig around and, you know, if you want to create your own fabrics and things, that's obviously a big investment for a lot of people. I think that's what I see quite a lot. As people want to or connect this, you know, this supplier and this textile mill, for example, but they need a large minimum order quantity to get that done. And that's obviously a barrier to a lot of people. So um, this is obviously why it gets dominated by very big brands. Jen, do, 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 do businesses, um, fashion businesses have issues? You, you mentioned in your presentation, kind of knowing where their resources come, where their materials are coming from. What do you, is there any specific you didn't really is there any specific solutions to that how they can find out where the what the lineage of the of the materials are I think it's about investing the time into learning you know that there, there are these things available and the British Fashion Council are doing some fantastic initiatives and um, they've launched a positive fashion initiative and have things like manufacturing and supplier databases um, you know that there's all kinds of databases that where you can access this it's just about dedicating you know the time to doing it and i think the the issue is as well as a smaller luxury brand often there's minimum order quantities which can if you know you're trying to strike up relationships directly with 
um, organic cotton mills, you know, you can run into challenges like that where it's just not financially viable. However, there are lots of great opportunities out there. And I know that there's been some brilliant things done with, with wool within the industry, with both larger and smaller brands. So there is opportunity and potential there. It's just about going to the right platforms to try and find out. There's a, a company called EcoAge who are doing some brilliant things. Um, so there is information out there. Grand, we've got a question for Ashley from uh, Julie. Uh, what should we do with complex fibers com from com complex fiber com uh, composition fabrics, uh, carbon production waste at the moment, since there is no solution yet? So, what's um, so are we talking about like, like poly cotton blends, or what do we mean by this? Um, I, I mean, kind like of the more like the pets, uh, the, the materials from pets and, and com complex monomers and things. Yeah, I mean, there are obviously different technologies. This is where you start getting into this, you know, uh, chemical recycling and um, various kinds of advanced recycling, as some of you might call it. Um, and there are different ways to do this. As I said, there's, there's pros and cons. You can, you know, where you can really take it back to the molecular level, but then you have issues with, uh, well, it gets more difficult to purify the products to get the commodity chemicals, which they use to make synthetics. Um, Cotton generally is only done one way and you can separate, for example, you can just destroy the polyester and get the cotton back out, but then obviously you're throwing away part of the feedstock. Um, the difficulty really with those things is, is to get two uh, viable streams from that. So some kind of cellulosic fiber. Um, with those technology, you can't turn cotton into cotton. It's always turned into something else generally, which is usually a, a viscose or a lyocell fiber. Um, so there are ways to do it. Um, the problem is a lot of them are at lab stage or they just kind of, they have a small pilot plan, which is just used for research and development. Uh, many people, you know, often looking for funding for these kinds of things. Um, but also, you know, it's, it's a very new technology scene. There are many potential ways it can be done. And I'm sure um, it can be done better as well. So I think the next five, 10 years, you'll, you'll see um, development in this space, but actually to get to a position where this will be done at scale is, is, is an order of decades, really. It's not something that is, is gonna be done by 2025, as many brands seem to want to happen. 20, 2030 even, I think, is too optimistic, let's say. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but if, if you want to uh, specify something specific, maybe I can, uh, I can let you know. Uh, moving on to a question to Ross, if, you know, um materials can be recycled using new innovation technologies. How geared up is the textile recycling and waste industry to change to this tr transition? Because ultimately you're, you're moving away from a business model of, of collection sorting and exporting to redistributing new materials. Yeah, so I think a lot of people started looking into this and we've been doing some pilot projects with some chemical recyclers and the hardest thing is actually recognising the material content. Um, obviously, what it says on the label isn't often in there. So we've worked with a team at Imperial College and are used in an optical scanner, which is in the process of learning the different fabric types. And at the moment, sort of the cotton um, chemical recycling is within a 2 to 3% tolerance, which is causing a lot of problem because obviously you've got button zips, so then they have to come off and it's just adding lots of layer of process which in, again adds cost so at the moment it's just sort of very much early days and we're just working out how it fits into our system and then you go on to do just have a completely different system that is geared for handling waste that's purely going to go straight to chemical recycling and sort of divert from the reuse the rewearing level um, and whether AI technology can be bought in and there's automatic sorting systems which again I don't think I'm sure it is out there and the technology can be adapted from other systems, but you're back to funding and who's going to pay for this. And actually, I think people recognising that there's a demand and a need for it. So, again, you've got to get a lot of different people involved and in the room to get the system done and then, you know, finance it and work out how it works. So it's, it's not an easy thing, but I don't, I don't think it's anything that can't be done. Um, we've got a question from, from Philip. Uh, what is the trade-off between carbon efficiency and recycling processes? So I think that's probably one best for Ashley. Yeah, I was typing it. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Yeah, I mean, 
as, as I showed with the slide, you know, the, the range from these kind of mechanical recycling processes, just going back to the fiber level, you know, they're a lot lower carbon. It's, it's quite simple in terms of what you need to do, but um, it's more limited in terms of feedstock that you can accept um, in being able to deal with blends and synthetics and uh, technical textiles, all kinds of things. Um, so of course, you know, if you want to actually separate things and you want to get really pure products, which can actually be cycled many, many times in a circular economy, um, then you need to you know, spend a little bit more energy to do that. Um, however, what I would say is plenty of work to show that, um, let's say pet polymer recycling with a chemical method, um, can save energy compared to virgin production, which is important. So if a recycling process was more energy intensive than virgin production, it just wouldn't make any sense to do it. But the, the other angle as well is that it actually has to replace the material on the market. Otherwise you're just adding, uh, something to, you know, whatever exists. So it needs to. That's why I say we need this fiber to fiber recycling so that we can actually, you know, displace the, the petroleum PET on the market. Um, same thing with cotton. You know, if you want to do chemical recycling of cotton to make rayon fibers, you actually need to start replacing cotton in your garments with those fibers. Otherwise, it just doesn't make any sense long term. You're just creating new things while keeping the old things. And uh, there was kind of two sides to, to to your presentations one more technical and innovation and then more about kind of design and and the the, back, the backdrop to to the industry and consumers are important and there was a big, great part of uh, jennifer's presentation where she mentioned that young people and kind of this new new wave of employees don't want to work for these big for, for big companies unless they're sustainable so it's something Ellen MacArthur is talking about. How, how do you make, it's, it's a very big, broad question, but how do you make, circular needs to be stylish. Is there a style to circularity? Is there some, yeah. Is, or is it just an overcoming of the season mentality? Um, I can comment on that from having moved from teaching design students and then through to working in business school over a period of about 15 years. This was when about 15 years ago was the point when students started to be interested in this topic in my experience. And it often seemed to be those students who were more innovative that were picking up on this as a topic. Um, so it seems to be seen as quite a cool trend in itself. And it's something that certainly my daughter and her friends who are in that sort of age group are, are very interested in. Um, and I think it's seen as something that's coming more from grassroots rather than being imposed on them uh, by older people um, so much. Uh, so very similar to Jennifer's comments earlier about the fact that we don't necessarily want the government to impose things on us and people should be consulted. And I think that that is the same really with the difference between the generations. So I think it is uh, just kind of organically there, so to speak. Um, that it's just, it is seen as a, a cool thing. And it's something that people need to put an effort in at the moment to do. And I think that's, that's why it's cooler. It shows that somebody's made an effort in the same way that with clothing, um, they've gone to an effort to, to be a little bit different um, to the mainstream. So I, I think there is that already. I don't know if the other panelists would agree with that. Yeah, I definitely agree with that, Helen. And I think we've come on leaps and bounds as well with regards to what retailers would call hanger appeal. You know, there used to be a sort of, a, I guess, assumption that sustainable clothes weren't cool. And I think that that has completely changed over the past 10 years. And now, you know, we've got Selfridges who are launching buying better initiatives. Um, I mean, I think it's highly unlikely that the British Fa Fashion Council would consider supporting an emerging designer that was in any way conducting practice which was harmful to the environment. So there is definitely like a shift um, coming through in that regard. Grand. And on that positive note, I'm going to close the uh, bring the Q&A to a close. I uh, want to thank you all again, all the panelists and all the participants. We've got a few more questions in the Q&A. They're quite technical or specific. So um, we will look to get the panelists to answer them. We are going to be distributing the slides and the resources that Helen shared and any, uh, I, someone mentioned the quotes that you shared, Jenny. So we'll, we'll, we will be sending an email out to you afterwards. Um, so yeah, once again, thank you very much for attending. This is an ongoing conversation and we hope to um, 
you engage with our future future emails and yeah watch this space for more 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 discussion around textiles and the circular economy thank you thank you very much thank you everyone